I think I have to say golf. Get them on, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Come on. All right. Good morning, everyone. I think everyone's in from the waiting room, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is session IC 101, Impact of Cardiopulmonary Function on Wheelchair Seating and Mobility in Adults and Children. Um, I'm Ellen. I'm going to be the moderator this session. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, you should have been muted when you were uh, admitted from the waiting room, but just take this moment to ensure that you are muted. Uh, I'm going to provide the CEU code at the end of the session. I will say it verbally and type it into the chat. Um, we're going to handle questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to type them into the chat as you come up with them, but we will address them at the end. And I believe that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa Kreitzer and Laura Dobrich. Hi, everyone. I'm Teresa, and uh, this, is, this is Laura. <laughs> nice to see everybody today. Um, and we're going to be talking about the impact of cardiopulmonary function on wheelchair seating and mobility in adults and children. Um, in terms of disclosures, we'll show some equipment, but we don't have any financial ties to um, any company. And, um, but funding was received for three of the papers that we um, will uh, mention in the presentation. These are our objectives today. We basically want to raise your awareness of the cardiopulmonary system and um, make sure that you are considering respiration when you're doing wheelchair evaluations and prescriptions. The cardiopulmonary system can be evaluated objectively and the outcome measures you obtain uh, can help support your clinical decision-making and provide a, a evidentiary support to insurance companies for the need for adaptive seating and pos positioning. So objective one, we're gonna look at the 3D nature of chest wall expansion. And we're going to start with the, do, looking at body positioning in wheelchairs and the impact of gravity. So just to kind of orient you, I want you to take a look at this image and tell and think about what do you see that's wrong with this picture? So if you start, you know, with the head down, you see that the head is um, uh, protracted. The shoulders are forward. In fact, the back canes are pushing into the back of the shoulders into her proximal humerus. Um, you can see the slinging of the back on the wheelchair. And you can also see, likely I'm sure you can don't have x-ray vision to see through the those horrible lateral supports there, but you, you can imagine that she probably is in a posterior pelvic tilt and her arms are internally rotated. Um, and so, you know, arm positioning is important because they are attached to the torso. And then well, I want you to look at this picture and think about what's right about this picture. Um, and some of the things that I see here are, um, there's really nothing against this young boy's posterior um, upper chest wall. He has nice spinal extension, rotation. He has neck extension and a chin tuck, external rotation uh, and shoulder abduction. So his, he has a really open lateral chest wall and he's using the other arm for counterbalance. And so what I'd like you to do, this presentation is a little bit interactive. I want you to sit like the woman in the first picture, like you're really slumped um, over, your head is down, across your forearms, across your, um, your legs, and get in a posterior pelvic tilt. And I just want you to take a normal breath. Now I want you to take a deep breath. Did you feel that impedance um, there in your chest wall? Um, with the expansion in that position um, of flexion. And now I want you to sit like the second picture uh, of the young gentleman in a wheelchair basketball chair with spinal extension, neck extension, external rotation of your shoulders. And just take a deep breath in. I'll take a really deep breath. So you can, do you feel the, the expansion that you can get? And so, you know, think about that positioning with spinal extension, you know, shoulder, more retraction, external rotation of the shoulders increases the amount that the chest wall can expand. And that allows more air to flow in, increases the lung volumes. And so chest, according to Mary Mastery, breathing is three-dimensional. So chest wall expansions happen, you know, anterior, anterior and posterior, superior and inferior and lateral. And 
this image here from, from Hillegas's text shows, um, you know, as you know, the diaphragm has attachments on the rib cage and the spine. So during inspiration, the diaphragm descends and flattens, and you have increased volume of air in the thoracic cavity because of our friend Boyle, uh, Boyle's law, which states that air flows from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. And that increased volume of the thoracic cavity provides that area of lower pressure. So then you have the bucket handle motion here of the upper chest and the pump handle motion um, where the um, lateral ribs are elevated um, in, that, in that motion. And so gravity, um, you know, now that we understand the movement of the rig cage, let's think about the impact of sitting in a wheelchair. In sitting, um, think about that superior inferior expansion. Would that be, you know, gravity eliminated, gravity resisted? Pretty much this is against gravity. Your, count, your chest wall is coming up against gravity. Posterior expansion in the wheelchair is going to be inhibited by the postural the surface that you saw in that first image of the first woman. And then lateral expansion, that's sort of with gravity. So those are important facets to remember, especially when you're thinking about lateral support and um, spinal support. And so normally, if you don't have a neurological condition, positioning and flexion, say if you're supine, you have your knees bent, a little head flexion, that can facilitate diaphragmatic breathing. But you know, think about if you have a child or an adult with a neurologic condition who has low tone, spasticity, scoliosis, kyphosis, or de denervation of the abdominal, uh, abdominals or the intercostal musculature, that spinal collapse that can occur can include breathing in all planes. And so spinal is support is very important for breathing. And you'll see some actual examples that Lore will provide soon. Um, we're gonna look at the literature on people with neurological disabilities and the impact on their cardiopulmonary function. So we'll talk about people with spina bifida, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury, and stroke. And again, according to Mary Mastery, remember that every muscle that inserts or originates on the trunk is both a respiratory and a postural muscle. So breathing is always gonna win because we have to breathe. Posture is what sometimes gives way. And the other important point that I wanna make here is that the cardiopulmonary system is the oxygen transport system. If it's failing, the muscles in our body can't get what they need to operate. So attention to breathing is really a top priority with individuals with neurological conditions, even with seating and mobility. It's, you know, so you have some abnormal physiology that occurs in neurological conditions. You may have respiratory muscle weakness, paralysis, or abnormal tone. Um, this is going to restrict chest expansion and ventilation and cough force. That's an important aspect too. We cough is, is prominent in some of these conditions. And then you have retained secretions and atelectasis can develop. I'm going to talk a little bit about spina bifida first. And so I think majority of you know what spina bifida is. Um, the main point of this slide is that it, this is a condition that requires multidisciplinary care. It involves all the systems. And there is an increased risk of obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and pulmonary complications, including sleep disordered breathing. And there is a lower level of physical, inact higher level of physical inactivity. And pulmonary dysfunction is, and respiratory failure were actually found to be by DeCiano and Wilson, the second and third leading causes of mo mortality. Um, and so we know that also that restrictive lung disease is a predisposing factor for pneumonia, impaired oxygen tolerance and quality of life. And so some of the contributors that we thought we, when we did a, a study that I'll tell you about, we thought scoliosis, obesity and denervation of the muscles of respiration were what were gonna be impacted um, in this condition in spina bifida. So we did this study, impact and neurological level and spinal curvature on pulmonary function and spina bifida at the University of Pittsburgh. And these were our aims. We wanted to describe pulmonary function and determine the impact of neurological level, scoliosis and obesity on pulmonary function. And so, you know, we did a medical chart review. We did socio, we gathered sociodemographic information, body composition. We used arm span instead of height because of pelvic obliquity and scoliosis, um, neurologic level pulmonary function testing and exercise stress testing. And so we found um, 
in this population, it's a cohort of 29 people that just over that over 60% had restriction or spirometric re restriction. And that was based on the criteria of total lung capacity being less than 80% and FVC being less than 80%. So we also, if you look at this slide, this is a histogram of the spirometry and the lung volume outcomes for participants in this cohort with lumbosacral and thoracic neurologic levels, and it compares them to, on the left-hand side, it shows the predicted normal. Um, and so you can see here that predicted normal total lung capacity is 5.26, whereas in lumbosacral, it's 4.31, and thoracic is even lower at 3.01. So you can see with pulmonary restriction compared to the predicted normal values that the total lung capacity is reduced for lumbosacral and thoracic lesions in people with spina bifida and to an even greater extent in those with thoracic lesions. So overall, in summary for this study um, that we did, you know, we found a high prevalence of pulmonary restriction. And in the people who had the thoracic motor level, nine out of 10 of them had restrictive pulmonary uh, function. And we also found that more rostral levels and a greater degree of scoliosis was associated uh, with a higher degree of pulmonary function. So let's talk a little bit briefly about uh, cerebral palsy. Um, we know that respiratory problems are a significant cause of morbidity in people with cerebral palsy. And that's based on um, an article by Bowl et al. And factors, they found factors that have a negative impact on respiration include chronic aspiration, impaired airway, Teresa, you seem to have frozen. Hi, sorry, I think we must have lost our connection. Anyways, with cerebral palsy, um, you have these respiratory problems that are a cause of morbidity and mortality, but the problem is that th these individuals may not be able to do standard pulmonary function testing, like they can't close their lip around the mouthpiece. So one study by Barks and Shaw did find that they could conduct pulmonary function tests with non-invasive face masks. So these are important considerations that you may want to refer your um, client or patient to for pulmonary function testing if you have these concerns. Let's take a look at spinal cord injury. People with spinal cord injury are very vulnerable to respiratory illness, especially in the first year. And this can, they continue to face respiratory complications throughout life, and it is one of the leading causes of death. Teresa, we cannot see your slides. Are you able to share? Yes. Sorry, I think when you cut out and came back in the yeah, it didn't during the screen. Okay, give me one second here. No problem. Is that better? Um, we're still seeing you, not the slides. Okay, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Gotta go to Zoom. Share screen, screen two, share. There we go. Do you see, uh, no problem is it's not sharing. Um, we see the title slide right now. And it's, it's not changing. Okay. Um, would she say it was control F? No, it was F5. That didn't work before. Okay, Zoom. Oh, it's so bad. 
Let me stop the share. Make sure I have the, okay, so let me do this. This is where we were before, but then, yeah, I don't think I did. So I'm gonna share screen and I'm gonna share screen too. I think it'll work this time, maybe. Are you able to see my slide now? We're on, yeah, we're on the title slide. Yep, now we're, yep you're, you're advancing through. We're good. Okay, sorry, excuse the, uh, the, the flipping around here. We're at the 45 minute mark, by the way. So I'll pop off again. Great. Okay, so um, we went over spinal cord injury, um, vulnerable population. And this slide, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. You can take a look at it later, but this shows the neurological level and the respiratory impairment and support that would be required. So like C1, C3, um, people may, would require a ventilator. Um, whereas like C5, independent respiration is possible, but you may need initial ventilatory support and the diaphragm function is intact, but the intercostals and the abdominal paralysis can cause decreased lung volumes and decreased cough strength and effectiveness. So these are things you know, that we need to consider with the different levels of spinal cord injury and the impact on pulmonary function. And this is, uh, I wanted to add this in for, especially for ATPs who are going into the field now, especially with COVID and people are going into the homes rather than into clinic. And so one of the things with spinal cord injury, you have to be aware of autonomic dysre dysreflexia. You have to treat it as a medical emergency. And it's an increase in blood pressure when there's a noxious or vicious vis visceral or cutaneous stimuli. And you may see some of these signs and symptoms here, nasal stuffiness, headaches, sweating above the injury level. Typically, this is common in individuals at T6 and above. And so this is something you, you need to get help with and call 911 if you can't resolve it immediately. And so response to autonomic dysreflexia, this is another common condition in people with spinal cord injury. And this is when um, the, this, and there's some really good information on this on the Christopher and Dana Reeves website. They have information on, on AD, orthostatic hypotension. And so they have all that, but the response to autonomic dysreflexia, you may have to sit up sit the person up, raise the head to 90 degrees and lower the leg, loose, loose and restrictive clothing, check their blood pressure. You know, maybe they need to catheterize or do their bowel program, but you need to remove the stimulus that's causing it. And then orthostatic hypotension, this is common in the early acute phase of spinal cord injury. It's defined as a decrease in systolic blood pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury or a reduction in diastolic blood pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. And usually upon changes of positioning, like from supine to upright, and, and regardless of the presence of symptoms, but the symptoms you wanna watch for are dizziness, lightheadedness, feeling of passing out. So you have to give people, like, especially if you're working in the home, be close, spot them and make sure that you're, you know, um, uh, being safe. And um, uh, one of the heart, one um, reference talked about the Heart and Stroke Association of British Columbia actually talked about wheel, lowered wheel, they called it a lowered wheelchair position. It's basically seat dump. It can actually serve almost similar to an abdominal binder and help manage um, blood pressure. And then this slide basically is showing that um, uh, they did a study, Inskip did a study, and they found that in adults with autonomically complete spinal cord injury, seat dump compared to ele an elevated seat, like um, anterior tilt, could be used to bump up blood pressure. So um, this, this can be all considered when you're writing your letters of medical necessity. If you're looking for um, a t alternative um, reasons um, to support respiration, as well as you know the musculoskeletal system. And so basically positioning considerations to prevent pneumonia, your power wheelchairs are gonna be able to switch positions you know, tilt, recline, elevating leg rest. But what's important is it's very important to check their vitals in all these positions because maybe they desaturate when they go back into tilt or recline. Um, and so you can help them to tweak that and find the, find the um, position that they have the best response of their vitals. Um, manual wheelchair users, of course, we always think about the least back support that's needed to promote that spinal extension and chest wall expansion and foster trunk rotation, um, as well as unimpeded shoulder and scapular range of motion. 
And just in terms of providing diaphragmatic support, that, like we said, with the with wheelchairs and seat dump serving as um, almost serving as an abdominal binder, abdominal binders, TLSOs are very common to use. And Laura will talk more about that, and you'll get to see some of her clients who use that. I'm going to talk briefly about cerebrovascular accident and stroke. Um, you know, with stroke, you would oftentimes see weakness or spasticity. And it involves the diaphragm and intercostal. So a paralysis of the hemi diaphragm does affect posture, balance, and it impacts normal respiration. Oftentimes in people with stroke, because they're moving less, you, you may not see, they may lack the clinical symptoms because there's such low level exertion. But remember that pulmonary function testing is revealed to have decreased volumes and flows to 60% of normal in these 70% of normal in this population. Pneumonia is, um, it occurs in about 5% and aspiration actually close, occurs in 60% of post-stroke pneumonia. And so that's an important consideration if you're working with a speech and language pathologist and an occupational therapist, making sure that the person's head and neck is positioned for optimal swallowing to prevent these things. Um, and um, I'm going to move on to atelectasis. We definitely want to pre prevent that by working with um, individuals um, positioning and improving their swallowing to prevent aspiration as best we can. Um, and then I want to talk about objective three briefly. We're going to talk about cardiopulmonary outcome measures and how they can support your clinical decision making and wheelchair prescription. So now you understand some of these neurological conditions and the impact um, that can be had on their, on their morbidity and mortality, how do we measure these things? And it's important to consider these measures when you're doing a wheelchair evaluation. Sometimes we forget about these. We're thinking so much on the musculoskeletal system, but we do want to measure vital signs like heart rate, oxygen saturation, blood, blood pressure, and PTs and OTs are trained on heart auscultation. So we should measure all those. Um, we can measure chest wall expansion and um, chest wall expansion typically is measured. You take a tape measure and you wrap it around and um, you go under the axilla. I'm going to tilt my camera down just a little bit here under the axilla at the xiphoid process. And then you measure halfway between the xiphoid and your umbilicus and you go around with the tape measure and measure that, um, you know, your chest wall can expand, you know, like pretty like, you know, a few inches, but when you have somebody with a neurological condition, you may not see that chest wall expansion. And that's something you can document. If you measure chest wall expansion in various positions, you know, sitting, you know, tilt, recline, um, all these different positions, you can have objective evidence, you know, that may show that the chest wall expansion increases in different positions. If you have somebody who comes into clinic and they're ambulatory, Oftentimes we would do the timed up and go, or if somebody is in a wheelchair already and you're looking to maybe, maybe they come in a crappy depot wheelchair and you're looking to do an ultra lightweight manual chair, you can do the 30 meter, uh, 10 meter push test, which is 30 feet. But what I always do is I measure um, blood, uh, sorry, I measure heart rate, oxygen saturation. That's very simple. If you have the, the right equipment, it takes two seconds. And, um, you know, and then afterwards you measure that again. And I always get RPE, rating of perceived exertion, because that can tell you, even if you have somebody on heart rate lowering medications, they, you, their heart rate not, they may not tell you everything that you want to know, but you can use the timed up and go for people who are ambulatory, or this is a scale that we designed as well a pit where um, it's a wheelchair rating and perceived exertion scale. So you can use either of these scales to, um, you know, test the rating or perceived exertion and include that in your documentation. And now then you can get into more expensive testing, which you can't do in the clinic, but you know, this is something that is important that maybe is, you know, a referral is necessary. So you can do armagometry exercise stress testing that assesses the cardiovascular and pulmonary system response to exercise. And it's basically a graded maximal test that just increases in increments while you keep the rate, the revolutions per minute the same. And it can tell you the extent of a person's physical conditioning or deconditioning, safe levels of daily exercise, and you can use it to monitor your therapy to see if it's improved. And then again, like pulmonary function tests, like I said, with that study we did, you need a lab who's, you know, can work with wheelchair users, which we did set up at Pitt 
And um, they were really good at working with us and developing these labs so that they were more accessible. And um, pulmonary function tests, you know, it um, tells you more specifics about how things are working. And now objective four, we're gonna get, uh, Laura's gonna come up and she's gonna give you some case studies um, of individuals with neurologic disabilities. And um, we're gonna see a couple of the children that she worked with and how she addressed um, their um, respiratory needs through seating and positioning. Okay. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm gonna take this mask off. Okay. So um, I am going to be presenting two case studies from um, children that I work with, and in brief introduction to myself, I am a clinician, not a researcher, and my primary patient population is um, students at a specialized school for vision impairment and multiple disabilities um, from the ages of three to 21, and additionally, I am certified in the Schroth method for scoliosis treatment, and I treat outpatients at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh particularly for scoliosis. So those are my areas of specialty. And um, the case studies today are um, two children from the School for Blind Children. One is a younger student and one is an adolescent. And they are both um, students with low muscle tone. Unfortunately, we don't have somebody with, um, with a higher muscle tone today. But um, just to show you how the neurological system can impact um, pulmonary function in seating um, for kids who don't have necessarily a primary cardiopulmonary diagnosis. All right, and to, to get started, we're going to um, review a few articles that relate specifically to the case studies. Um, the first one is from Lynn et al. Um, on the effect of different seating postures on lung capacity, expiratory flow, and lumbar lordosis. And for this study, they looked at um, uh, lung function in four different positions. Well, I guess, yeah, four different positions. The first was standing. The second was a fully slumped posture. The second, or the third, they called normal posture, which is pretty much a 90-90 position. And then the last one they named WOBPS, which it, in this case, they, um, they positioned the seat kind of like dump, like, like Teresa was talking about with a spinal cord injury. So the seating system as a whole wasn't tilted, but just the seat was um, tilted on it, with regard to the back. So the, lower, the back part of the seat was lower than the front part of the seat. And then they added additional lumbar support. And what they found in this study was that all of the lung volume, all of the, um, the parameters were best in standing. So um, that might be something to consider when you're trying to uh, justify a, a wheelchair that, that, that stands. And in addition to that, they also found that the most uh, compromised lung capacity and expiratory flow were found in the slump sitting position, which you could guess. And then all of the parameters improved in their WOBPS seating as compared to their normal 90-90 position. And I should mention that the, the testing on this was more with people with, with intact neurological systems. Okay, and then the next study um, is an older study from 1986, um, Nawabi and Smith. And even though this is an older study, they're both um, applicable to our topic and they are um, cited frequently in the recent literature as well. So in this study, they measured the vital capacity FEV1 and expiratory time um, for eight children with cerebral palsy, both in a sling back type wheelchair and um, one with modular inserts. And in the seating um, simulator, they found that the, you can see here that the vital capacity increased almost 58% the um, FEV1 was increased to almost 52%, and the expiratory time increased by 55%, just from changing the seating components. All right, and this last one is um, a nice review article by Silianus and Grievous. Um, 
that talks about the pulmonary complications that can happen with moderate to severe idiopathic scoliosis. And um, while we are not talking about idiopathic scoliosis today, it's just, um, it's a nice thing to think about as far as these are, these are the things that can happen with a population of people who have scoliosis only um, and don't have any other un underlying conditions. And um, so you have to think about the fact that in idiopathic scoliosis with this population, most of the x-rays are done in standing. So um, when, you've, when you've got a population who has scoliosis plus an underlying neurological condition where they might not be able to stand or sit, the, the angle that they are getting in their x-ray is happening in lying. So you've taken out the effects of gravity and um, the population may also not have the ability to, to functionally compensate for the curve. So the number that's happening, um, the Cobb angle that you see in supine is probably exacerbated a lot when that person moves up to an upright sitting position. So the, you have to think about that the, um, the implications for the pulmonary system would be a lot greater in this population than the Cobb angle would, would necessarily suggest. Um, this topic really could be its own, its own um, lecture in itself. So we're going to move on from there, but just know that both of the um, case studies do have um, a diagnosis of scoliosis as well. All right, so this is our first case study. This is um, a seven-year-old girl who has um, chromosomal abnormalities with microdeletions of um, chromosome 15 and 16. She has had a very extensive medical history with um, hydrocephalus. She's had over 20 um, surgeries, multiple shunt revisions. She had a Chiari type three malformation, which is pretty rare and very significant. Um, and she had to have cranial expansion surgery to address that. But I will say that that surgery was very, very effective and it has um, helped her um, medically significantly since that time. She has um, partial agenesis of her corpus callosum, um, a unilateral renal agenesis, meaning she only has one kidney. She has um, severe difficulty with digestion and absorption. She was actually on TPN for almost a year and now is back to GJ feeding, which is great. Um, hypotonia throughout her body, um, a left scoliosis, and she wears bilateral hearing aids. And on the second picture, you can kind of see, we tried to show you the direction of her curve. So functionally, she can roll bilaterally. She, um, she can, um, she, she's trying very hard to transition to sitting by herself, but she still needs minimal assistance through side lying. Um, she has very inconsistent sitting balance and does a little bit better when she's distracted. She pretty much props on her arms to sit and you can see how collapsed she is. We'll talk about her posture in a minute. Um, she uh, uses a supine stander for about an hour a day, which she actually seems to like now. And she's just starting to accept some weight through her legs and supported standing for a few seconds at a time. So her posture, as you can see here, this is sitting on the floor. She has a very wide base of support. Um, you, can, you can kind of see in the second picture, the collapse with her curve into right lateral flexion. Um, her head is very forward in relation to everything else. Um, she, she bears weight on her forearms for her balance. And this is a child who, when you take chest expansion measurements in supine, she's a, primarily a diaphragmatic breather. And when she's sitting like this, there is really no appreciable um, circumferential change of chest expansion anywhere throughout the trunk. Um, so when you watch her breathe in this position, most of her breathing is superior. Laura, just want to let you know we're at the uh, 25 minute mark. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, part of the reason that, that we use this um, child for our case study is the access to different types of uh, equipment that she uses. And this is a commercial stroller that she has pretty much outgrown and it was actually donated by another family to her. Um, and she's, she's just about at the weight limit for it. Um, you can see her posture in this, in this um, stroller. First of all, she has a brace, we'll get to that. She cannot fit in this stroller with her brace. Um, her feet are too long for the foot 
plate, if you can call it a foot plate. She's still externally rotated. She's very, very collapsed to her right side. Um, and that first picture is probably, um, probably mirror imaged because the, the one in the second picture is the, what she really looks like. Um, she really pretty much collapses out of the stroller. And um, it, very, very similar to the slumped posture of the first article that I talked about. And the reason that she uses the stroller is really because of the push handle alone. Um, her grandmother is her legal guardian and, and um, has to be able to manage her and the equipment and the grocery cart and everything else. So um, this single handle push handle, that one little piece of this equipment is what makes things more useful for her grandmother. Okay, I'm gonna move on to some other pieces of equipment. This is her, um, her own uh, Mighty Light stroller. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of her with just the H harness because she was literally falling out of the chair with that. And now this is after we switched her to the full um, torso support vest. And you can see, um, similar to the first few pictures, she still is leaning forward a lot. So she's putting a lot of weight into the front of the chest harness. But if you look at her overall posture, it's actually pretty good. She, she looks like she is pretty aligned. Um, you, you can bet that she's not getting any anterior or, or very much lateral um, expansion from her breathing, but Teresa pointed out she's so far away from the back of her, um, of the back of the, of the stroller itself that she probably is getting some posterior expansion. So this is definitely better than the other stroller and floor sitting. Um, this is her in her custom wheelchair without her brace. So Again, same, same basic posture. She, she might be more upright. She doesn't have to put as much weight through her arms, but she's still very forward, very far away from the back of the chair. She's, um, she's definitely leaning forward anteriorly. Um, and you can see her, her lateral support is supposed to be supporting her laterally, but it's really very posterior to her seating position. And again, she's got so much weight into her anterior chest harness that she's not getting very much expansion in her diaphragm. Okay, so this is just looking at her in the stroller versus the wheelchair. And really you would think that the, the wheelchair should be the better sitting posture for her because it's more custom, but honestly, just looking at her as a clinician, she actually looks better in the, in the um, stroller, but um, the breathing may be more impacted in the stroller, it's hard to say. Okay, so this is the first day that she got her actual TLSO, um, which is custom made for her based on her scoliosis. Um, it has a large abdominal cutout, which I'm not sure if we, if we mentioned that or not yet, but there's been a lot of um, research to show that if you have the abdominal cutout that it allows um, for better breathing. Um, and then the cutout to, um, on her concave side to, to allow some expansion in that direction and movement of her, her rib cage toward the concavity. So this is her in upright sitting with her TLSO. And now this is her in her custom wheelchair with her brace, which, which has changed things significantly for her. So it's not perfect. And we can certainly talk about how, how to make things better. But in this first picture, you can see there's, her head is not so much forward. It's definitely more in line with her body. Um, in the second picture, you can see how the lateral support is more supporting her laterally, even though she doesn't need as much support now that she has her brace. And um, sitting posture in the front, she's not, it's hard to see there, but, but you know from the second picture, she's not leaning so much forward and she's more upright. And then the cutout allows for um, diaphragm expansion. Okay, and this is a comparison in her wheelchair between um, no brace and with her brace, and you can see the big difference there. All right, this is our second case study. Um, and this, this girl was 16 when these pictures were taken. She has a history of prematurity at 30 weeks, um, pretty significant um, neurological impairment for that level of maturity, uh, a grade three and grade four interventricular hemorrhage, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, PVL, retinopathy of prematurity and um, cortical visual impairment. So her scoliosis was, I believe, diagnosed in 2018 with a um, right thoracic curve of 34 degrees and a left lumbar curve of 11 degrees. And I don't have any more recent x-rays to tell you if that has changed or not, but this is what she looks like right now. Um, this curve actually appears to be more like an idiopathic curve, but that's, that's definitely a topic for another discussion. 
Um, she presents with postural hypotonia, some spasticity of her quads and hamstrings, very significant um, spasticity of her ankle everters and plantar flexors, and has had um, multiple surgeries to, to um, correct her foot positioning. She can um, transition from supine to sitting with very minimal assistance. She can maintain sitting with supervision, as you can see here. She participates in sit to stand and stand pivot transfers with moderate to maximal assistance and inconsistently takes steps in a gait trainer. Um, in, her, in her sitting posture here on a bench, her weight is very posterior, but she collapses forward and to the left. Um, so this is this are these are side views of her sitting um, on the bench with no brace. And um, Teresa added some nice visuals here to show you that um, where her ASIS is in posterior in comparison to her PSIS. So um, she is she is in a posterior tilt, but it's more of a collapsed posterior tilt than an active one. Um, she has a very wide base of support. Her, her center of gravity is backwards. Like she, she puts more weight very far backwards almost onto her sacrum, but then collapses her trunk forward. So I'm gonna go back there for a second and just talk about the, the pulmonary implications of that for how collapsed she is forward into that, um, to that left side, how, um, where her breathing would tend to be. You can see in that very first picture, the rib hump is on the right in the back. Um, so she's very, very collapsed to the left. I may have said that wrong before, but she's collapsed to her left. And um, so very, very minimal to no expansion on her left side. And this is her in a commercial stroller without a brace. Um, I'll be honest here, this is not her stroller. We just wanted to show um, what she would look like in a commercial stroller. And it looks very much like how she sits on a bench. Um, it, you would think gravity would take her in, into the back of this chair, but it doesn't. Um, the chair is actually in a bit of a dump and it, it really doesn't matter. Her, her po sitting posture was already posterior. So she's sitting back there and she's still collapsed forward into the left side. Um, and then this picture is just primarily to show the distance from, from where her shoulder is to the back of that stroller and how the, the back of that chair is giving her no postural support whatsoever. Okay, and now this is in her, her custom wheelchair without a brace and I and with a brace. So this, this is a comparison slide. Um, and just to tell you that, that this, um, this girl is fortunate in that her mom does have a wheelchair accessible vehicle and she wears her brace most of the time. So her, her posture in the second picture is more like what we see on a, on a daily basis. But just to see the comparison between the two, in the front, her head is um, more forward, more flexed. She's still laterally flexed in both pictures, but, um, but that changes. Um, she's more upright in the second picture. Her eyes are more vertical, so she can, um, she can use the vision that she has. And, um, and you could just um, kind of extrapolate. I don't have a picture of her TLSO, but it looks very similar to the first one with the cutouts in the abdomen and in the concavity so um, that she can expand better into those areas and she's not so collapsed forward. Okay, and then this is just a lateral view of no brace and brace. And in the second picture, it, you may not be able to see it there, but she's actually smiling. Um, her head is more in line with her body. It's still a little forward, but it's not flexed like it is in the first picture. Her, her, she, has, she has trunk extension. She actually has some um, lumbar extension, which she never gets anywhere. Um, and her, her arms are more free to move. Her, her vision is unimpeded and her abdominal cavity is open. All right, so the takeaways from those studies, and we can certainly take questions at the end. Um, does the TLSO always improve respiration? And I don't want you to come away thinking that that is true because it is not. Um, you'll actually find a lot of research to say that TLSOs can um, decrease lung volume. So you really have to have the right brace. Um, the Fraunfelter article talks about abdominal cutouts and how that, um, how that can really help with um, improving respiration with a TLSO. And if, um, if a client has a scoliosis, the brace really needs to be, um, to be custom for that particular curve. Um, so having the right orthotist is key. 
Uh, the second one is, is a stroller or standard transport chair always the wrong decision? And our answer to that is no, it's not. And really you have to think about so many things with that. You have to think about um, the caregiver as well as the, the client. And the ideal situation would really be to have a, a stroller or a, a, a secondary chair as a convenience item that you would use for short term. And we're gonna talk about that just in one second with this ideal versus reality. So really thinking about the length of time in a day that a piece of equipment is used. And for most of us, we spend about eight hours a day, one third of our day in bed. So um, I highly, highly recommend any of the talks on the 24 hour posture care and websites like the simplestuffworks.com to think about the positioning of our neurological clients in bed because um, it really is a third of their day. So like I said, it's great to have an optimal piece of equipment for long duration for, for school hours or work hours, and then a secondary piece for convenience. And those of us who are clinicians know that we, we think that we're supposed to give the, the perfect um, scenario and, and put our clients in the perfect position all the time. And it's just not reality for a lot of people. You have to consider that some of these people are dependent on um, another person who might be a single caregiver or an elderly caregiver, or the caregiver might have repeated use injuries from, from, um, from doing so many transfers. And then think about the vehicle and how many people actually have a wheelchair accessible vehicle and need to lift the equipment in and out um, every time. What's the home entry like? I actually had a student that we found out <laughs> the, the, the child was leaving their wheelchair at school and um, being transported in a stroller and we came to find out that they had literally 24 stairs to get to their front door. So that's, that's huge. And that's something to really consider in a, in a city like Pittsburgh. So sometimes they do leave their, their wheelchairs at school, manual or power chairs, because power chair entry and transport is even more difficult than a, than a manual chair. And then can you justify a wheelchair if you leave it at school or home? And I, I think that we, we tried to, to say that, yes, we can, but I know that there, there are definite limitations in um, what insurance will provide. We're very lucky in Western Pennsylvania that um, the, the variety um, charity has been providing a lot of secondary strollers for students who already, for, for children who have um, already a, a wheelchair. And then um, what can you do to improve the posture and function with a less ideal piece of equipment? And that's what we're gonna show you right now. I'm gonna hand the microphone back to Teresa and there may be a lag in our video when we switch over to camera. Just gonna give you guys uh, coming up on the 10 minute warning. Thank you. Everybody. And so, As Laura mentioned, we're going to tie it together now, um, looking at um, wheelchair positioning components and the 3D nature of breathing. So this study was also done at the University of Pittsburgh, and um, just going just briefly that you know there were a uh, scanning device was used in order to determine that you know people may uh, customized seating may be warranted versus you know an off shelf back um, in manual wheelchair users, and you can read more about that. Um, this is an area, you know, in terms of postural support, it's an area where technology could be improved. You know, we see planar seatbacks um, and even curved seatbacks and our backs aren't really linear or curved, you know, like we have, you know, cervical lordosis, lumbar lordosis, and we want to try to support those areas, but the seatbacks that are uh, present uh, don't always have that. So what are some of the ways that we can improve chest wall expansion? I'm going to switch to the uh, video now. So you, there'll be a slight break and we're going to just kind of show you uh, a couple ways. Like when you do your evaluations, um, a simple technique that you can use is using towel rolls to determine maybe where you want to add foam in that seat back to improve respiration. So we're switching to that. And so um, I have these towel rolls here. Yeah, they can. Can you guys see our video? Adrian, yes. can you see? We, we, okay. we can see it. Okay, great. So um, we're going to start with a using use of a couple towel rolls. So if we try to, if we use, we'll start with a lumbar horizontal 
role. And Laura's sitting here in this not so great wheelchair, but we're just using this to lean forward and then come on back. And this can kind of open up her shoulders um, with this towel roll. And um, that stabilizes, you know, the spinal column and allows her, brings her shoulders back a little bit. If we didn't have these back gains here, she would, she would be able to really expand. Now, if she leans forward, we can also use a, a thoracic roll. And so it's probably a little smaller, but we can kind of come under her scapula. Let me fold this in a little bit. Um, go ahead and lean back. And that can kind of allow her scapula to come over, bring her shoulders back, and again, open up the chest wall. Sometimes people, this feels really good in there. So you just kind of have to experiment. You were going to say? I was going to say the first case study we did this. For her. Yeah. For, so the first case study Laura did, this is what they did to help improve posture. So, and then the other thing is you can do um, just to kind of evaluate, you know, anterior tilt, go ahead and stand up. You know, you can use, go ahead and sit down there. And so Laura's, you know, pelvis is, you know, in this, um, uh, has a towel under her ischium. And of course you want, you know, more even support, but these are some really simple things that you can do to try to, um, you know, work with your client and determine in their wheelchair, you know, what, what you can do to help improve their posture. I'm gonna switch back to the slide presentation now. And uh, share share the video. I'm going back to the slide presentation. Give me a second here. We can see it. Great. <laughs> and so um, these slides basically show you what I just showed you with Laura. Um, on this one, you know, we use the vertical towel roll along the spine to open up the anterior chest wall and decrease shoulder protraction. Um, and in these ones, these basically show you what I just did. I wanted you to be able to have this as a visual um, for later. And this shows the use of um, the ischia roll. And anatomically, that encourages lumbar lordosis. Um, and um, you know, this depends on how much support the person has with their torso. Um, you wouldn't want to, you know, necessarily use just a towel roll. Somebody has poor sensation. I'm, what I'm suggesting is that you can use these as evaluative tools when you're in the clinic and help to decide on your cushioning, your seat back, and where are the areas that you need extra support. Um, and then thinking about um, the seat back on pulmonary function, some of these fl more flexible systems, um, the laterals can be moved forward or backwards or higher or lower um, and, and um, offset. And you can choose between, between different densities or multiple layers of foam um, for different combinations. Um, even, even a simple planar back, even if you get like a, a hinge for the lumbar lordosis, it offers a little bit more um, impact on the, on the spine. And then um, this is the Rojo agility back. And what I wanted to show with this is it's, it's of course air, but what's nice about this is that you can actually customize this. So, you know, we're in this image where it shows like four and then three and then two and then one. Four is like a four inch cell and then it goes to two to, and then gradually decreases. So you could actually use this. That could be like, that could be simulate your lumbar support, but it's, air so it's um, not compressing it's allowing your lateral expansion it's allowing your posterior expansion with the use of air so those are considerations um, you can also do you know we've also done custom molded foam back support this is a um, it, person with myelomeningitis seal who has a quickie too and this mold was created by blackburns by john beers and he molded the the foam in the back to allow better support for the scoliosis. Even though it was a manual chair, we still use customized support and that is possible. The other thing is think about the upper extremities. A lot of times we don't think about that, but you know, if they're internally re rotated, that's gonna affect your breathing. If you can get the arms like even to neutral or externally rotated. And so these are some examples 
um, you know, since the arms are tied to our cord, we want to bring the arms away from the body and, you know, try to open them up and get that lateral expansion so that the ribs aren't impeded by the upper extremity. So these are some tools that you could use. Um, and then, like Laura said, you know, standing is amazing. I mean, it's a great benefit. And Rosna has a, a paper out now on the benefits of standing um, that you can take a look at. But, you know, you can see here this young girl, you know, she has some nice trunk rotation. Her head is a is little bit rotated and upright. She's using all of her vision. Um, she's level with the teacher and, you know, um, her posterior expansion is unimpeded, you know, which is really important. That's a position that people are using, you know, for COVID to improve pulmonary function in, in people with COVID. And we know, and I know for a fact, like when I worked at the school for blind children that we had, a, I had a couple clients who their oxygen saturations were generally low. And when I would put them prone over a wedge, even though it was labor intensive to get them in that position, their oxygen saturation would go up closer to a hundred. So that opening of the posterior chest wall is very important to consider. And then lastly, our last objective, um, we're gonna look at the impact of physical activity on cardiopulmonary function. And, you know, these are some of the benefits. I mean, there's multiple benefits, but you, you not only have peripheral adaptations, you know, muscular adaptations, but you also have central adaptations like increased stroke volume, increased aerobic capacity, um, and, you know, for athletes um, who have disabilities or without disabilities, you know, endurance training increases the slow twitch muscle fibers, sprint training increases the fast twitch muscle fibers. So depending on what you're training, you know, you make increases there. Um, this is a scale. This is what we developed this scale. This is possible to use with people with spina bifida. If you're not sure where to start as far as exertion, we did this uh, study on the group normalized rating of perceived exertion and found that a good starting place, for example, for people with spina bifida for exercise is around five to six. So they're between that getting more tired and tired. So that would be, that would compare to like a moderate range on the Borg scale. And, you know, so the main takeaway is I want you to know, you know, we both Laura and I want you to know, help your clients to find physical activity that they enjoy so that they are exercising their lungs and, you know, getting that, the, that pulmonary expansion that they need, you know, help them to set SMART goals, seek tertiary funding, like she mentioned with Variety of Children's Charity. Um, there's a lot of organizations. Um, United Spinal is a great organization. Um, and, you know, different, different organizations and um, Move United as well. And, and find local adaptive sports agencies or start your end. Laura, two minutes, Laura started a, um, a beatball <laughs> program at the school for blind children. Um, this is just the physical activity recommendations and children need 60 minutes a day. But here's an example of beatball. You could start something like that. Here's power soccer. You could play backyard soccer. <laughs> Um, even just, you know, walking in outside with family and friends, exercising in the park, um, more specialized sports like fencing. Um, and then there's some more information on hand cycling. And it, like this bottom left picture shows a young boy. And these are the kind of trikes that Variety of Children's Charity provides. And you can see, you know, he has nice trunk rotation. His back is away from the back. He's more active in his movement. And that's what we want to see. So I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions. And I'm gonna go down to the slide that has our contact information as well. So I'll stop sharing in a second here. And then you can see both. Teresa, there are some um, questions that have been posted in the chat. Do you wanna read them yourself or do you want me to read them out to you? Yeah, let me, yeah, can you read them? Sure. Let's see, go back up to the top. Um, someone asked any information on cardiopulmonary function with anterior tilt. I have not been able to find any good research on this, but clinically feel there is a significant difference in a positive manner, unless it is a person with a high level of SCI. I mean, physiologically, yeah, if you are, I, and I can, I can send some information, but if you're more in that anterior tilt, um, you know, if your pelvis is in more of an anterior tilt, your spine follows and you're going to get more extension. And we know that extension 
um, facilitates, it actually facilitates more upper chest breathing, whereas flexion facilitates more diaphragmatic. But in general, if you have that anterior support and you have that spinal extension, the, the chest wall can expand and allow more air to flow in. Um, another question, have there been any studies on the impacts of breathing using supportive equipment such as a TLSO compared to nothing? Mary Mastery has a study on that. And um, I think they found improved, um, they found some of the pulmonary measures were improved with the TLSO. Um, let's see, another question. If we need to use a chest strap with someone with a uh, decreased pulmonary function, is it preferred to place the support under the axilla or below the xiphoid? That's gonna depend. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, can I have a yeah go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. okay. okay. back and forth. <laughs> okay. So it, that is going to depend on each individual person. Um, if you have somebody who has um, a concern with the expansion and already has, has low um, oxygen saturation, you might want to not do a full vest. You might want to look more at like the female cut so that the diaphragm is more open. Um, and if it's somebody like my first um, case study who's leaning so far forward into their support, you might want to try to, to change the, um, the, the positioning of the wheelchair itself in the seat more so than the vest, because they're going to be leaning forward no matter what, if you don't address the pelvis first. Great. Um, it is about that time. I did post the CU code in the chat. I'm just going to say it now too, in case anyone needs to pop off. It is ZN3Z2K. Um, we did get one more question. Um, if you guys want to answer this, then maybe we can wrap it up. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. Many of my kids really need to have an anterior trunk support. Uh, this coupled with the backrest inhibits breathing twofold, if I'm understanding correctly. If we recline them using tilt so that they are safe, is this a better approach to helping them breathe better throughout the day? Or is the tilt providing too much against gravity? And then it ends up being null between the chest strap and the tilt. It is a really, that's a complex question. That's a really good, oh, sorry. That's a really good question. I think, you know, you, I think what I would do is I would measure, I would take the vital signs in all the different positions and find out what, um, if there's changes in the vitals in all the different positions. I mean, that's true. If you're in tilt, you're not going to get as much posterior expansion. Um, but, you know, we always recommend change as a position. So ideally, you know, maybe you find that position between, you know, um, where they have, um, you know, good chest expansion, um, but maybe they're upright a little bit in between like full tilt and, you know, upright. So you kind of have to play around with it and do your evaluation and really look at those objective measures and see, see what you see when you examine that. Great. Um, I'm getting some messages here that the CEU code is not matching up. Um, that was the co code provided to me. So I'm going to try and figure out real quick what's going on. Okay. Sorry, everyone. And also, if you guys have any questions like for us that we didn't get to answer, um, feel free to um, contact us. I can put our slide up again. Um, it, Laura is at the School for Blind Children and I'm at Duquesne University and you can feel free to contact us, you know, with any questions that you, if you come up with that didn't get answered. It looks like the link is not working to the right survey. That's what I'm seeing. Okay. So we'll have to let uh, ISS or Sivet know. What will they do? They just give another survey or something or? Um, I am not sure. <laughs> well, actually, it's right. Uh, hmm. Sorry, folks. 
Yeah, it's, it takes to the on-time mobility. Okay, we'll have them address that. It says it takes you to the IC10 course, so. Oh yeah, there, there's something wrong with the uh, with the link there. Yep. I'm gonna guess that the code that was given out is going to be the correct one. We just need to have them change the um, the survey on the website. So if yep. anyone wants to hold on to that code, we'll try and get this fixed and then you should be able to use it. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. All right, thank you everyone. We'll get this uh, straightened out. Just give us a few minutes. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Bye bye.